Hi, today we're going to talk about 1950s to 1945 to 1960 in Western fashion and this is a very interesting topic because this is so different from what we are used to these days and some of the fashion that does come back from time to time and it's really interesting to look into so let's look into that now. Uh, fashion in the years following World War II I just said war <laughs> World War II is characterized by the resurgence of haute couture after the austerity of war years uh, Square shoulders and short skirts were replaced by the soft femininity of Christian Dior's new look silhouette so it, uh, with its sweeping longer skirts and fitted waist rounded shoulders um, which in turn gave way to an unfitted structural look in the later 50s so da, 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 da. now let's look at the ge general trends so return of fashion by 1947, the Paris fashion houses had reopened and once again, Paris resumed its position as the arbiter of high fashion The orderly rhythmic evolution of fashion change had been disrupted by war and a new direction was long overdue the padded shoulders, tubular boxy line, and short skirts that had been around since before the war and was identified with uniforms was gone. A succession of a, a style trend led by Christian Dior and Cristobal Balenciaga defined the changing silhouette of women's clothing throughout the 1950s television joined fashion magazines and movies in disseminating clothing styles the new silhouette was narrow shoulders and a cinched waist bust emphasized in longer skirts and often with wider hands and beginning of the eastern fashion now during the early 1950s designers in the decolonized third world sought to create an identity distinct from European fashion. Urban professionals in Asia and the Middle East, for example, might wear western style suits with indigenous headgear such as the, an um, a fez or kefiye. Uh, in India, the traditional Sherwani was adapted into the Nehru collar business suit. So while the women uh, frequently wore saris in the workplace, so what, meanwhile a red Chinese developed the unisex Mao suit uh, in green and blue and grey to promote socialist value of equality. Due to their minimalist and modern design, both style of suit was later to be adopted by MOD and uh, British invasion trendsetters during 1960s and 70s, especially during Beatles and the Monkees. And uh, now let's look at the casual clothing and teenage styles. Uh, one of the uh, post -world, uh, World War II economic expansion was a floor a flood of synthetic fabrics that are easy to uh, care processes so it's called dry, dry nylon or lawn or decoron which could retain see heat set pleat after washing so it became immensely popular during this time acrylic polyester uh, dry acetate and Spandex were all like introduced in 1950s during the 40s nylon stockings were an incredibly popular product as they were a very lightweight alternative to uh, silk and wool stockings for uh, during the duration of World War II 
the DuPont uh, company produced nylon exclusively for the war effort. Um, at the end of 1945, the demand for nylon stocking was great, that nylon riots ensued at stores um, selling the products. Social changes went hand in hand with new economic realities and one result was that many young people would have become wage earners early in the teens before the war uh, now remained at home so depended upon their parents through high school and and uh, beyond uh, establishing the notion of teenage years as a separate stage of development so teens and, and college co-eds adopted skirts and sweaters as a virtual uniform and uh, the American fashion industry began to target teenagers as a specialized market segment in 1940s in the United Kingdom the teddy boys of the post-war period created the first truly independent fashion for young people uh, a favoring and exaggerated version of Edwardian flavored British fashion with skinny ties and narrow tight trousers worn short enough to show off garnished socks uh, so um Right, so in North America, greasers had a, a similar social position. Previously, teenagers dressed similarly to their parents, but now re a rebellious and different style, youth style was being developed. Um, young adults returning to college under the GI Bills adopted an unpretentious functional f wardrobe and continued to wear blue jeans with shirts and pullovers for general and formal wear after leaving school. Um, mm, uh, um, Jack Kerouac um, introduced the phrase Beat Generation in 1948, generalizing from his social circle to characterize the underground anti-conformist youth gathering in New York at that time. The term beatnik was coined by Herb Kine, uh, Kane of uh, San Francisco Chronicle 1958 and the stereotypical beat <laughs> look of sunglasses, beret, black turtlenecks and unadorned dark clothing provided another fashion alternative for both uh, youths of both sexes encouraged by the marketing specialist of Madison Avenue. N so let's look at the woman's wear. New look revolution. Now in uh, on a 12 February 1947 at 10.30 a.m. exactly Christian Dior aged 42 presented his first collection at 30 Avenue Montaigne, uh, which was strewn with flowers by La Chambre. I don't know if I'm reading this right. Uh, the editor in chief of Harper's Bazaar, Caramel Snow, strongly believed in the couturier's talent, which he had already noted in 1937 at the Cafe Anglais model. That he designed for Robert Pigott, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but yeah, that's all right. At the end of the fashion show, she exclaimed, It's quite a revolution, dear Christian. Your dresses have such a new look. <laughs> that's in a quote. A correspondent from Reuters seized upon the slogan and quickly wrote it on a note that he threw from the balcony to a courier posted on an avenue montaigne. The um, news reached the United States even before the rest of Paris, Fran uh, rest of France, where the press had been on strike for a month. Um, with his new revolutionary new look, Christian Dior wrote a new chapter in his 
in the history of fashion. Furthermore, in order to write it, he literally uh, constructed it with his own hands. The designer had to hammer away at stockman mannequin that was too tough and unyielding to bear a preparatory canvases of his visionary wardrobe, says his friend Susanna Lilly. And so big with big nervous blows of the hammer, he gave the mannequin the same form of ideal woman for the fashion that he was to launch. This does sound like a Shakespeare novel that came from the 1500s. <laughs> very dramatic and very like the 50s. His aim was clear, his hand did not tremble, I end quote, quote, I wanted my dress to be constructed, molded on the curve of female body whose contours were, uh, would, they would style, stylize. I accentuated the waist, that the volume of the hip emphasized the bust in order to give my design more hold. I had nearly all of the fabrics lined with Persil or taffeta, um, renewing a tradition that had long been abandoned. And this guy is a genius, I believe. Thus, on 12th February 1947, at 10.30 a.m., the announcer introduced numero un, number one. The first outfit was worn by Mary Therese and opened the show during which the audience saw 90 different creations filed past belong to two principal lines, on wheat, I think I'm writing, saying it wrong, and Corolle, and Bettina Ballard, fashion editor at Vogue, had returned to New York a few months earlier, after 15 years spent covering French fashion from Paris. We have witnessed, in a quote, we have witnessed a revolution in fashion at the same time as revolution in a way of showing fashion." End quote. The softness of the new look was deceptive. The curved jacket peplum shaped over a high rounded curved shoulders and full skirt of Dior's clothes relied on an inner construction of new interlining materials to shape the silhouette. This silhouette was drastically changed from its previous more masculine stiff triangular shape to a much more feminine form. Throughout the post-war period, a tailored feminine look was prized and accessorized such as gloves and perils, um, which, which were popular. A tailored suit had fitted jackets with peplums usually worn with a long narrow s pencil skirt day dress had fitted bodices and full skirts with jewels and low cut necklines or peter pan collars shirt dresses with a, a shirt like bodice were popular as um were halter top sundresses skirts were narrow or very full held out with petticoat pool skirts were <laughs> it was a brief fad. Ball gowns, full skirted gowns for white tie occasions were longer and ankle length dresses called ballerina length um, uh, reached to the floor and worn to balls as they were today. Cocktail dresses are smarter than a, a day dress but uh, not as formal as dinner or evening dresses were worn early evening parties, short shrugs, bolero jackets, often made to match low-cut dresses were worn. Meanwhile, in Israel, a simple biblical sandals, um, blue uh, cotton shirt and utilitarian khaki military-inspired dress remained popular choice for many women due to ongoing economic austerity and the need to uh, feel prepared for the war. Uh, so now, let's look at the intimate apparel. Christian Dior's new look collection in 1947 um, brought a re 
evolution to the fashionable silhouette of 1950s, Dior's nostalgic femininity of round shoulders, full skirt, padded hips, and tiny waist replaced the boxy style of the wartime period of World War II. The um, trend of the hourglass silhouette brought up by popularity of uh, Dior's guarantee they market for intimate apparels. Um, although intimate apparels were usually hidden by outerwear, intimate apparel is especially emblematic for the contra contradictory beauty in the 1950s. As an the silhouette was created depends on the type of foundation garments worn. So foundation garments became more essential items to maintain the curvy silhouette, especially must be skirts and horsehair uh, padding. For example, the sale of corsets doubled in the decades of 1948 to 58. Um, Dior's new look collection brought back the boned intimate apparels for women, even the young one, in order to create the feminized uh, silhouette that embraced the femininity, especially the waist area. Bond corsets were a thing. Um, a Simington corset uh, company of the market of Harborough was one of the famous intimate apparels products producers in the 1950s, as they were in a fashionable producer of uh, Dior's corsetters and gir girdles. Or all the girdles were produced in the same design in either black or white. The sugar pink cotton velvet trimming was a particular feature of the range and uh, some were woven with uh, Christian Dior's initials and elastic panels on the side. A uh, brand new brie nylon fabric was introduced by the British nylon spinners. So this fabric was popular fabric to be applied to intimate apparels in 1950s because it was one of the first easy to launder uh, and wash drip dry fabric. There was a full corset advertisement in 1959 uh, shows the popularity of Brie nylon and the design of the corset corselet <laughs> in the 1950s. The exquisite Dior corselet features jaguard um, elastic net with down stretch back panel of stain elastic. In the enchanting front panel is in brie nylon lace and market uh, highlighted with crisscross bands of narrow vel velvet ribbon. It was um, side fastening, so it's easier. Partly hook and eye with a, a zipping extension, so very light bony, is covered with velveteen. I would imagine this would be quite fa uh, famous, uh, useful these days too, for especially um, uh, on an evening level, evening wear level, probably a big uh, ball or a fancy dinner. Uh, a show probably where you formal formal wedding types where you need to uh, maintain that feminine silhouette with the feminine dresses from the uh, advertisement it is not hard to find a car slide in 1950s for constructing details with boning and panels different fabrics and different elasticity and it was very 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 um, durable, I would say. Uh, they had more knowledge of boning, maybe more knowledge of boning and um, more knowledge of uh, corset making and boned corset making, hence the term boning. Uh, then now, uh, I believe that now the corset industry is coming back during the corset fad these days, uh, exercise corset or something like that. But um, I think that uh, if it's used in a right circumstances, it could be uh, making a good impact. Not bad. It's good.
wow, the corslet shaping a woman's body with tiny waist and big hips. A new change of bra called cathedral bra was introduced and became popular in the 1950s. So it is it is called cathedral bra because there would be pointed arches <laughs> created by the bones over the uh, the breasts when the bra is worn. So the bones are also separate and well, it defines the shape of the breast by pressing it uh, into a pointed like a bullet shaped bra. Um, therefore, cathedral bra is also called a bullet bra. I have so many jokes on that, but now let's just continue on this. Take a few deep breaths. And, uh... Okay, this whole video could be a very long joke, but jokes aside, it's serious, it was part of history and things happen and I don't know how this happened to be a very popular intimate wear choice back in the day I'm uh, because I do not remember going back far back I never seeing anything like this before because usually during fashion recurrence it will re come back uh, after a while, like this shape in the uh, 1950s, that famous shape with full dress. It's very reminiscent of the old uh, 18th century uh, uh, dresses that has very nice cinched waist and corseted bodice and going down to full bodice skirts flowing everywhere even in inside the skirt you would have some kind of structural thing going on to make it look more full and bigger skirt and at the top it will have clean lines of defining body shape but uh, never have I ever uh, remember seeing any uh, any in any time in history a bullet bra was the first to create it in 1950s and it became like a wildfire so uh, very interesting though interesting this brassiere design was popularized by actresses like Patti Page Marilyn Monroe Lana Turner which, who was nicknamed the sweater girl oh no uh, wearing the bullet bra with a sweat oh now I understand why sweaters were such were such a popular item in nineteen fifties. <laughs> yeah, okay. Got it. Although this brazier design was designed for wearing strapless cocktail strapless cocktail dresses and evening gowns and uh, became popular during the nineteen fifties. The market for this design was short-lived because it was likely to slip down or, oh, of course, yeah, need to adjust for the evening. I do not believe that this could be for a strapless the dress. No, could never hold it. Uh, um, however, another brassiere design re-entered the market and grew popular in the 1950s, which um, influenced the modern intimate design. Underwire bra were the first introduced in the market in the 1930s, but it was um, forced to quit the market because the steel supply was restricted in the 1940s for World War II. Underwire brassiere design re-entered the market as it helps to uplift the shape of the breast to form trendy curvy silhouette in the big bust in 1950s made with nylon elastic and nylon lead steel underwires the underwire bra helps to create fashionable high perm bosoms underwire bra is still dominating items in the modern intimate apparel industry those who are Females in my subscribers who are watching my videos at this point, you should thank the 1950s era for your pain 
for your sufferings, for wearing underwire bra. You know the struggle where you uh, wear the bra and then after a while it just peeks through and the little rounded edge at the side will just run off because you sweat, you know? And it will just keep on digging at your skin and slowly scratching it with metal. <laughs> and it becomes a little rusty after a while. Yeah, that's when you know you have to throw it. So, clothes for the space age. Now let's look at that. This is so interesting. Uh, for the mid-1950s, a new unfitted style of clothing uh, appeared in, uh, as an alternative to tight waist and full skirted associated with the new look because this look could not last long because it is such a, an uncomfortable shape it looks amazing, it looks great you look very good and sexy looking but after wearing that much girdle and like that much corset you are bound to break Vogue magazine called the knitted chemise the t-shirt dresses so uh, Paris designers began to transform this popular fashion to haute couture uh, fashion designer um, Balenciaga had shown unfitted suits in Paris in early 1951 and unfitted dresses in 1954 in 1958 Yves Saint Laurent um, Dior's protégé and successor debuted trapeze line, adding a novel dimension to Chemise's dress. These dresses featured a shape, shaped bodice with sloping shoulders and a high waist. But uh, the signature shape resulted from a f flaring bodice, uh, creating a waistless line with bodice to knee. So it's just a straight shape, which is more my speed, I would say. These styles um, um, only slowly gained acceptance by the wider public. So Coco Chanel made a comeback in 1954 and an important look of the latter 1950s was the Chanel suit ah, with a braid trimmed cardigan style jacket and a line skirt. By 1957, the most suits featured lightly fitted jackets reaching just below the waist and shorter, narrower skirts. Balenciaga's uh, clothes featured few seams, plain necklines, and following his lead, chemise dresses without waist seams, either straight and unfitted or princess style with a slight A line became popular. Uh, the sleeveless princess line dress was called skimmer a more fitted version was also called sheet dress um, now let's look at the sportswear because I do not imagine quite a lot of sportswear probably a knitwear in the 1950s for especially for women in New York had become an American designer a center during uh, the war and remained so especially for sportswear in the post-war period women who had worn trousers on war service refused to abandon those practical garments which suited an informal aspect of the post-war lifestyle but by the 1955 tight-fitting drain pipe jeans became popular in American women. The casual sportswear was also increasingly a large component of women's wardrobe, especially the white t-shirt was popularized by Bridget Bardot, Sandra Milo, or Milo, <laughs> I don't know, between 1957 to 1963. The casual skirts were narrow and very, or very full. I would choose the narrow one because the full skirts has tend to have such a tight waistline and I'm not good at the waist unless I exercise quite a lot. <laughs> In 1950s, pants became very narrow and were worn ankle length. I remember those pants. A 
especially those pants that was worn by Marilyn Monroe herself. Icon. Pants cropped at the mid-calf were houseboy pants. Shorter pants below the knees were called pedal pushers. Uh, shorts were very short in the 1950s, early 1950s, and th mid thigh length Bermuda shorts appeared in 1954 and remained fashionable throughout the remainder of the decade. Loose printed uh, or knit tops were um, fas also fashionable with pants and shorts, so they were also wore bikinis as to sports training. <laughs> Uh, swimsuits, including Gotex, um, brand popular in Israel and America, were one or two pieces with uh, some had loose bottoms or shorts with short skirts. Uh, high waisted bikinis appeared in uh, Europe and South Pacific islands, but not was not popularly or commonly worn in the mainland America until the late 19th probably was resented beginning uh, but I do agree the pictures in the 1950s of the female actresses were always with bikinis would always look beautiful if you look at Marilyn Monroe and uh, Sophia Loren they're so beautiful now um, let's look at the uh, 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 hats and hairstyles because that was very, very, um, that was such a important, important segment in that style era because everybody was keeping so much, um, scrutiny over how they, uh, are perceived, um, how they they had to keep that kind of rigidity in 1950s, especially in the early 1950s. If you look at that, uh, those videos that was made, um, I'm, I'm not sure what it's called, but now, uh, what's it, PSA, public announcement or something? Um, it's more like, it's a video, it's like a story for a lesson for for the young teenagers to learn from the video like it's such a bad acting but it is a very uh, it's an example good representation of that period of people's thinking um, I think it was very rigid back then well you'd have to be because it's just um, that that time was right after the world war and it was it was after chaos. You needed to have some rules. <laughs> so now let's look at hair and hairstyles, hats. Hair was sh worn very short and curled with the new look. Y the uh, With the new look, um, what is very important is the waistline, the figuring. And you don't want to draw that away from with your hair. It's very long. Excuse me, I'm going to drink my water. And hats were essential for all but most casual occasions. And wide brimmed saucer hats were worn in the earliest 19, uh, earliest new look suits, but Smaller hats were soon predominated. Uh, very short cropped hairstyles were fashionable in the early 1950s. By by the mid decade, hats were worn less frequently, and especially at, as fuller hairstyles like the short curly poodle cut and later bouffant and beehive was fashionable. The quote unquote beat girls wore their hair long and straight and teenagers adopted the ponytail short long <laughs> and let's look at the maternity wear and that's very important because 1950s i believe in the especially in in america or like 
Western uh, countries in 1950s was a baby boom era where I'm not sure if it's baby boom but it's, it's more like uh, they reproduce quite a lot during that time if you look at the strat uh, statistics they actually uh, was the highest uh, birth rate during that time I think that people were just happy to be back from the war and needed to have some family life and calm and peaceful life not a bad, not a bad thing right now, 1950s, Lucille Ball was the first woman to show her pregnancy on <laughs> TV and I remember this, the episode La Siente, was it? the episode was called Lucy something <laughs> uh, she did, she couldn't say pregnant but she w said it in <laughs> in uh, I don't know foreign language <laughs> the television show I love Lucy brought new attention to the maternity wear I remember her clothes they were just like a, like a long tent clothes <laughs> A tent shirt very long and uh, she looked really cute most of the maternity dresses were two-piece with loose tops and narrow skirt exactly stretch panels accommodated for the woman's growing figure baby boom in an Indian mm, baby boom in 1940s the maternity in, in the 1950s was also caused by focus on maternity wear even international designers as Givenchy, no, Norman Hartnell created maternity wear clothing lines despite the new emphasis on maternity wear in 1950s maternity wear fashions were still being photographed on non-pregnant women for advertisements mm -hmm. um, because it was a very taboo topic I don't know even you know that I I love Lucy shows where the Desi and uh, Lucy would have separate beds. I always thought it was very weird. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just very restrictive. It shows how restricted they were, even though they were married. So on uh, September twenty nine, nineteen fifty nine, the maternity panty was patented, which provided expansion in the vertical direction of the abdomen and the, the front panel of this maternity undergarment was composed of high degree of elasticity so in extreme stretch conditions conditions <laughs> the woman feel comfortable so that was uh, um, the woman's wear segment in 1945 to 1960s in western fashion I think we learned a lot I am so interested in I mean it's very it's very interesting to learn from the history uh, take the good but learn from the bad the bullet bra was the bad um, underwire bra is the useful but painful uh, I don't think we learned a lot from that maybe maybe some alternatives or something but you know 1950s style was not even new uh, those ball gown the big 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 ball gown Dior taffeta ball gowns with cinched waist they were not real um, they were not new um, it was just recycled fashion from 19, uh, 1800s uh, yeah, so they're learning from there we are learning from them so it all goes back in full circle and yeah, thank you for joining me today I hope that it was uh, enjoyable uh, for you to listen to me talk about 19... 45 to 1960s in western fashion as much as I did making it <laughs> thanks and I hope that you're relaxed by this uh, 
right? See you next history lesson. Next I'm thinking of doing earlier segment or mm, further away, 1970s or 80s. It's very important to look back into that, especially where if you look back into the history, the history is expressed mostly by, I think the most expressive history would be by the clothes they were wearing. It just shows the all the aspect of their lives through the clothes, especially in the 1980s. How do you understand their mindset? Look at the clothes they had, look at the hairstyles. You just know what they were going through. And I think the 1980s would be a very interesting segment. Very, very interesting segment. <laughs> okay. Uh, bye, guys. Have a good day.